The next part of this uh, webinar is going to be discussing applications of uh, homomorphic encryption over the integers. Uh, in particular, we're going to touch on a couple of um, the example programs that we have in the Palisade distribution, and then we're going to dive into a more detailed example uh, of doing a secure substring search using integers. So the first step was we're going to talk about the role of integers in encrypted applications. And Yuri's covered quite a bit of this, so there might be some repetition. And then uh, go over uh, at least the list of the basic examples and what their purposes are, uh, one of which you have just seen. And then finally, diving into the uh, more detailed application. So as far as the role of integers in encrypted applications, um, Palisade supports uh, basically three classes of, of, of schemes with encrypted operations. Uh, the first being Boolean operations with unlimited depth. This is what was covered in the previous lecture in this series. And FHEW and TFHE are the two schemes that are uh, um, actually um, in the Palisade library. The next is uh, integer operations with limited depth. Uh, BGV, BFV, and their RNS variants. That's this lecture. What I wanted to do is just uh, take a quick sidebar and, and, and mention what RNS means because not everybody uh, is aware of that. RNS means residue number system. It's a technique that breaks uh, rings of large bit width integers into parallel sets of rings that are each less than 64 bits. Uh, and this is allowing very efficient computation in 64-bit CPU architectures. Um, as, as you may be well aware, it's difficult to work with uh, word sizes on the order of hundreds and thousands of bits when you're working with regular CPUs. It becomes more of a, a data, data problem than a, uh, a compute problem. So when we say BGV RNS, BFV RNS, we're talking about versions of these schemes that have been internally optimized so that they would run faster on conventional CPUs. And then finally, there's the approximate floating point with limited depth, uh, and CKKS is the representative example. Um, we are going to be discussing this in detail in the lec next lecture. So which scheme you use will depend on the form of your data. So typical applications that are well suited for integer schemes are strings of characters, because characters are just integers. Um, private information retrieval using integer ID fields. This is a very uh, common application that we've seen. And also private set intersection, which is uh, the act of privately joining encrypted data sets based on a common field, which often is an integer ID field. Before CKKS was available, many AHA applications used a block scaling approach. This is something that uh, Yuri had uh, just mentioned, where we multiply all of our inputs by a large constant and then um, carry them as integers. This does require numerical analysis of the problem to determine how big the scale factor should be because, you know, the selection of the scale factor affects round off error, saturation error, and you also need to keep track of the increase of the scale during multiplies. For example, here you can see that multiplying two numbers which are scaled gives you a number that's scaled by the square of those. So um, you can easily run out of bits if you're not careful. So we, we generally suggest that you don't do this anymore. Uh, you should use CKKS instead. But we are actually going to be working on integers today. And some of the limitations we have in uh, homomorphic encrypted operations that people may not be aware of when they first come in and uh, try to use uh, homomorphic encryption, there are some common software operations that cannot be done easily. For example, division and comparison, two things we do all the time, um, are not easily done within homomorphic encryption primitives, and we usually use some kind of approximations for that. So often we find we need to recast our problem in order to craft a homomorphic encrypted solution. Uh, an example we'll see today is uh, we have to determine if two encrypted numbers are equal and we will be, be doing that uh, 
uh, using the, the tools we have available, and you'll see how we do that. And finally, uh, packed encoding, which we've discussed at length, um, allows us to take advantage of a single instruction, multiple data type operations, which can provide us with a great efficiency. Uh, but not all problems will map into the structure well. Um, and also SIMD comes with an amount of complexity. Efficient code can often be difficult to understand. So I'm going to touch on some of the basic integer examples from the Palisade distribution. Okay. Uh, the sample executables are in the public key encryption sub area. And here is the, the path to that. Uh, so when you build the examples, the binaries are there. The source code for the examples are uh, in this directory. And there are uh, a set of examples. For example, the ones that begin with depth are examples of variations. I'm performing chained multiplication for BGV RNS, BFV RNS, and BFV RNS B. Uh, simple integers contains examples of additions, multiplications, and rotations using packed vector encoding for BFE RNS. And, and this was the uh, file that Yuri reviewed in the first part of this webinar. Simple integers, the BGV RNS version is the same except for BGV RNS. So you can see by comparing those two files, the, the number of changes one needs to do to use one versus the other. And then simple integers serial, um, and there's multiple versions of that, show how we serialize, i.e. save to disk, the components of a crypto system, which includes the various keys and the ciphertext for both BGVRNS and BFVRNS. And using these primitives, you can actually construct um, very complex systems. The source code of all of these are of uh, these um, are in PKE examples, and there are also sample benchmarks that we have using Google Benchmarks in the benchmark directory. And for example, uh, we compare BFE RNS versus other types of integer encodings. So now I'd like to dive into an encrypted substring search application. Uh, let me ask if there's any um, questions so far. Yeah, I don't see any. Okay, good. So, um, so as I said before, string applications are are a very good area for integer computation, encrypted integer computation. And so, what we've done is we've built a sample um, application, uh, and we have a, a GitLab repo that we've just put together, and uh, you can go in there. Uh, we have the build instructions in README. Uh, it requires you to install the Palisade Development Edition. Um, it's been tested with the latest edition. Uh, it should be very straightforward, but it's a good exercise in showing how to use Palisade in a, in a system. That it contains prototype C++ code. Um, running a BFV RNS application. And there's two versions of it. The first one performs a plain text string search with, with no wildcard. And it uses the Rabin CARP method modified for homomorphic encrypted computation. And then it, it compares a plain text and an encrypted version. And in this version, what we do is we store one character per ciphertext, which would be your typical first step approach. Um, and the next version, we use the same algorithm, but now we use packed vectors of characters in ciphertext, and we show that we can search much larger texts using this method. So let me go into uh, the, the uh, concept of plain substring search and define some of the terms we'll use, some of the variables. So what we're doing is we're searching for a substring called pat in a uh, string called txt. The pat is of length m and txt is of length n. And the algorithms that we could use, well, there's a brute force substring search that we all write when we take our first programming language class. And that basically says we go through a loop where we offset into the text. And then for every offset in the pattern, we compare uh, 
the characters and the pattern in the text, and we return true if the computation is true for all of these values. And that is a uh, lot of repeated comparisons. There are far more efficient ways of doing that that we learn in our later computer science classes. So the example I want to give you is uh, the use of a rolling hash. Um, the rolling hash actually has a lot of interesting uh, characteristics that make it amenable to encrypted computation and will be taking advantage of them. A rolling hash of the pattern is computed once and a rolling hash of the, sub, of the uh, substring of text that's at the initial offset into the text of the same length as pattern is computed once and the hashes are then compared for equality. And the characteristic of a rolling hash, which is valuable here, is that we, instead of having to recompute the entire hash, we can offset this hash into text simply by removing one old character's value and adding one new character's value to the hash. And we'll show how that's done. Um, there's an initialization step, um, and these hashes are all computed modulus a given modulus, modulo a given modulus, and in this case p. And there's a uh, constant d, which is the size of the alphabet. Here it's 256 bits or 01 char. And this is, is typical code. Um, the hash is computed, let me uh, just get a pointer up here. All right, so the hash. Uh, values are initialized. Uh, there is a constant that we have to determine, which is based on the size of our pattern, uh, which is computed in this set of lines. And then the hash is simply taking this constant, um, and if for every character in the pattern, you're basically updating the value of the pattern, modulo some value p. You have a, a hash for the pattern and a hash for the text substring of the same length. You then um, go through the text one, one, one offset value at a time and you compare the two hash values. In order to update the text, you, you, uh, the text hash, you use uh, this formula here, which is basically you know, subtracting a value at the, at the current point and adding a new value at another point. And if you look at this computation, you, you have two multiplications, right? But one of them is by this value h, which is a, um, a number that we computed earlier, and the other one is by this value d, which ends up being a power of 2. So thinking about how we do things homomorphically, we could, we could replace that with a set of repeated additions um, to save one multiplicative depth. How do we convert this to an encrypted form? Well, one of the reasons I chose this was um, it's very amenable. There are no disit, there are no divisions. There's only additions and subtractions and multiplications. So, so right there, that that makes it a prime target. Math is performed modulo some large prime, and as Yuri mentioned before, um, that is uh, that is how all of our math operations are. Usually, large primes are selected large enough so that you really don't worry about um, the modulus activity. But in this case, we're going to take advantage of the fact that, that there's a modulo in there. Okay. Uh, there's also a limited number of multiplications. There's one per character of pattern, and there's also one for each update into text. So the, um, that, that kind of uh, gives us an, a feeling for how deep our computation needs to be. We just really need to count the number of, of uh, characters in the text that we want to scan. Finally, a multiplication by a power of two constant can be implemented with a binary tree of addition. So that's, that basically has reduced our multiplicative depth by a factor of two, the, the requirement. Um, and the hash comparison can actually be done with an encrypted subtraction. So if I have two encrypted numbers, I want to see if they're the same. I subtract one from the other. And if I decrypt a zero, I know that they were the same. Okay. Um, also, we support a modulus of negative numbers. Um, so when we are talking about a modulus, a plaintext modulus, we're actually talking about numbers in the range of that modulus over minus p over 2 and plus p over 2 offset by 1. 
Uh, so we found that the test that they had in the original plain text version wasn't necessary in our encrypted version. So our first version of this is we decide we're going to implement our plain text strings as vectors of characters. Now, why are we doing this versus string? Uh, it's because we're going to write an encrypted version and we're going to have, instead of vectors of characters, vectors of ciphertexts. And so what we'll do is we'll take our pattern and we will encrypt every character separately, all right, and perform an encrypted computation on these characters. So we have a basically what is a vector of ciphertext, and each ciphertext corresponds to one character. This could have been an integer encoding, but we'll use uh, the, uh, the packed encoding just to keep the code same in both cases. So both text and pat are encrypted into vectors of ciphertexts, okay? Now let's take a look at how we do this. Um, this is a subset of the code. And since I am from the Terse School of Programming, I have defined a couple of, um, of quote, using uh, variables. So the ciphertext is capital CT. Uh, and um, also crypto context is abbreviated as CC. So in a previous section, I have built the crypto context it's contained in my variable CC. I have a public key, and um, let's just look at this section here. We have to build H, but the thing is we don't have to build H in an encrypted manner. Um, so we just have to encrypt the value of H. Now there's a variable here that I use. Uh, there's a helper function. I'm gonna define what these helper functions are, encrypt repeated integer. And when I go down to the hash computation, since we're using the eval mull, eval add kind of uh, form, we will be using um, basically a, uh, you know, a, a declarative notation. So we can't just say, you know, this ciphertext plus that ciphertext in this context, we, we use eval add. So the code that we had in the previous slide, um, we basically do our add and then we do our, we, well, we do a multiply by D here, we do an add here, we do another multiply by D here, and then we do an add here. So this is how we do our, our operations, okay? To compute the hash values of the initial, uh, the initial hash of the pattern and the, uh, the text. Uh, these two functions I've defined are there to help us. Um, what we're gonna do is we're going to be working eventually with uh, packed plain texts and, and encrypting them. So rather than have two versions of that, I decided we'll just, we'll just use this value here that will let us encrypt, encrypt a single integer or encrypt uh, a repeated value of that. And you'll see why we do that later. But really all it's doing is building a vector and then using make to packed plain text to build a plain text of that vector and then encrypting it. There was a question about how we encrypt. This is how we encrypt. This PK is the public key um, defined at length up here. And then encrypt mult D means simply I'm going to do, in this case, there's 256. So I do eight sets of um, binary tree addition um, in order to do that. This just basically describes what I'm doing here. Okay. So. What I wanted to point out is that typically the noise growth due to addition is very small versus multiplication. So we usually um, tend to ignore it in the application level, but here we're adding a ciphertext with itself multiple times. So the noise of a, a ciphertext added to itself is going to grow faster than if you added independent ciphertexts because um, it has to do with how noise adds to noise. Now the growth is not as fast as multiplication of the two ciphertexts, but it is, it, it can be significant for large values. So we suggest that you use this approach with caution. So the code for updating the encrypted text hash for a new offset um, is as follows. Here we actually do our comparison, which is our eval sub of the two ciphertexts of the two hashes. And we save that in a vector. And then to recompute the hash, this, this line is the uh, C code that we would be using, and this is it in the encrypted notation. So you can see we have one eval mult, 
we have this encrypted mult by D, which is a repeated set of additions. And then we have a subtract and we have an add. And that's how you update the ciphertext version of the text rolling hash. So we go through the text this way and we generate a vector called encres. Now encres is encrypted result. Um, and when we decrypt that, any zero entries indicate that the hashes match. Now, since these are hashes, there is always a, a very small probability of a hash collision. So using a large value of P is, um, is valuable for minimizing that. But the result here should be considered a highly likely match. So if you um, are building this into a system, what that does is points to two substrings that you are probably going to want to examine uh, further. Another thing is that if we're concerned about leaking any information about the encrypted pattern or the text, decrypting the difference of the two hashes might leak some information, especially if a devious person wanted to manipulate the pattern. So one thing you can do, and it's often done in, in these situations, is we could multiply each entry in the result by an encrypted random number that the person decrypting wouldn't know. And then what that does is it randomizes all the non-zero entries and the zero entries remain zero. Um, so what's wrong with this? Well, you know, it's, it's great. It's the very first uh, version of the code that you run. Uh, the problem is it's not very efficient and it is limited. And it's limited by a couple of things. One, you need a ciphertext for every character in text. Ciphertexts can be large, so this is, this is a fairly large increase in memory requirement. The other thing is you need a multiplicative depth equal to the length of the text you're going to search. And that's a very serious limitation because generally the multiplicative depths that are used are on, on the order of uh, 20, 30, things like that, not on the order of thousands. And when you increase the multiplicative depth that you're asking Palisade to support, you're going to be increasing the overall system um, memory and computation requirements. So both of these limit the practical size of a text that can be searched. So come to the rescue, we can use packed encoding of vectors and SIMD operations. So we recast our problem in a way that we can perform these operations in parallel. So what we do is we slice the text into batches and then we pack these into encrypted vectors. That'll enable the SIMD searching of each batch in parallel. So if we pack these right, we can use the same code we just wrote to do a ring size number of comparisons, and I'll call that R, in parallel. And remember, R can be on the order of 32,000, 64,000. So this is a very large amount of parallelization. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to vectorize text in batches so that each vector has every kth character. And k is the number that we're going to talk about in a little while. And then we create a packed plain text of each vector and encrypt it. And this is going to give us a number L ciphertexts. Now, if we have a text of size n, n can be approximately n divided by the ring size to pack the entire text but it has to be adjusted to account for an overlap that we'll need. And it also must be greater than the size of the pattern so that we can still generate full hashes for comparison. So we choose K and L to provide an overlap in the batches so that there are no gaps in searching for the pattern in these batched versions of text. And I'll show this as a picture. So if we take our text and we break it up into batches and we have some overlap by M minus one characters, we can slide our pattern across text batches and cover all of the characters. We're going to do this in parallel. So what we're going to do is we take the first character of the first batch and we pack it into the first ciphertext. We take the next character and put it into the second type or text. We put the third character into the third ciphertext and repeat this for all of the batches so that we end up with a set of ciphertexts that are vector encrypted, okay? We have to select K 
right, which is the batch size. We have to base it on the ring size, and we have to base it on the lengths of M and M, so that a large text can be encrypted. Ring size is determined by Palisade when you select the plain text modulus, the depth, and the security. Now we can get ring size from the system by calling this function get ring dimension. And so if you look at the code, you'll see that's exactly what we use. And the actual values of K and L can be found with a simple iteration. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but you can look at the code for the details. And the overlap in the batches, okay, means that some of the characters are encoded more than once. But uh, that's okay. This is done to allow you to slide the hash over the L ciphertext without skipping any characters in the original text. So you see we've got a fairly complicated um, operation going on here, but what it lets us do is parallelize these, these hash comparisons. Okay. Finally, you know, K has to be less than the multiplicative depth. So K is the size of your batch. It's much less than the multiplicative depth to guarantee decryption. Okay. Now, that's how we do the text. And since text is large, you can see and, you know, why we have complications there. But for the pattern, pattern is very simple. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to simply do the same thing we did before, except we're going to repeat the pattern for every slot in that large cipher text, okay? Which then enables us to do basically slot-wise comparisons, slot-wise operations. And as we mentioned before, that's, that's how additions and multiplications and subtractions are done. They're done element-wise over these vectors. So the result is you can use the same code to compute every hash operation in parallel over all the batches, okay? And here's a picture of how we do this. We basically duplicate the first character in all the vector entries, and that's using that function, that helper function that I, that I mentioned earlier. That's exactly what this helper function lets us do, okay? So we perform the hash operations in the same exact way. We do the comparison in the same exact way. But now the output is, is a vector of vectors, right? It's a vector for each offset into the batch. And its, it's value in, in each one of these particular vectors is the batch uh, entry. So each zero entry in each output ciphertext vector now provides an indication of a match within that batch. And so you have to compute an offset into each batch and use that to generate the overall offset of the match in the large text. And there's a simple formula for that. And again, you can look at the code for details. So you can find this code in the repository. Like a lot of parallel programs, there's a certain degree of complexity involved in that. And the, the, the goal is that this complexity pays for itself in performance, all right? Now, the code has hardwired values for, for text and pattern, but there's code in there for you to be able to modify and, and play around with it. So both of these perform plain text and encrypted search and compare the results. It also times plain text versus encrypted search. Version 1 is looks for the word Anna in a text of 32 characters. 32 characters because we only really have a multiplicative depth on the order of, of, of 32. So to perform that search takes 18 some odd seconds and it finds one occurrence, okay? Version two looks for Anna in the entire text of Anna Karenina, which is well over a million characters, okay? And takes actually 16.5 seconds, finds 825 occurrences of that name, which is surprising. Why is version two even faster than version one? Well, the algorithm that we use to determine how many batches we have fits the entire text in 29 batches. So even though it's built to support 32, we only really needed 29. And what that meant is that there were 28 hash updates versus 25 hash updates and it pretty much uh, takes into account the, the, the difference in the timing. But you'll see here that what we've been able to do is in the same amount of time, we've been able to scan 
a much, much larger text. And this is the power of the Simbi parallelization. So in summary, there are some practical ob observations about how to build integer systems now. Yuri has gone over a couple of them, and I'm going to really repeat a lot of what he said, but you'll see in the context of this um, where it comes from. So in this circumstance, we were manually setting parameters. We wanted to set a plain text modulus, uh, and we wanted to set a large depth. Well, these all combine and can be very tricky to do manually. Um, and what happens is Palisade can throw exceptions during runtime that are not easy to understand. So in our example, we try to pick a, a P of 65537, which is uh, one of the common um, plain text moduli that we use. That's, that's um, in a depth of 32, which is an actually a fairly large depth for these systems. And what that does is it causes an exception deep in the math layer, and the exception is shift overflow. And you'd have to dive in there, and you'd find out that really what's happening is an internal computation during the parameter computation at the very beginning um, overflows the maximum big integer bit width that's specified in the default backend, math backend number two. So there's a couple of approaches that you would use to, to solve this problem. You can either uh, increase the maximum bit width in that library at build time, or you could use one of the dynamically sized backends. Again, you have to recompile the library to, when you do this. Um, ends up in our, in our circumstance just picking a, a larger size P worked well for this example. Um, so what I would recommend to people is that you write your code incrementally. Don't just build all of your code and then just assume it's going to work. Build your code, find an initial values of P, depth, and R um, that are useful for you. You might need some trial and error to find good values. Uh, in many circumstances, there are uh, default values that are provided to you. So by asking simply for just depth uh, and a security level, uh, you will get values of P and R that you can use. So um, in this case, we, we had to go in and sort of construct these things by hand. But um, usually there are some, some good default values. But you may need some trial and error to find good values when you do them by yourself. And another thing here is that the multiplicative depth for BFVRNS that you get is always approximate, but it is generous. Now, there are some standards that are used. Essentially, when you're asking for a certain amount of depth, you're asking for the system to provide you with values that give you an extremely high probability of decryption. Uh, homomorphic encryption using uh, ring learning with errors are, is always a probabilistic situation, but but the probabilities are extremely low for having errors, but they are, they are generous. And so that means you can often get away with a few more multiplies than the depth dictates. But if you do that, you're at the risk of failing to decrypt. So that's a, um, you know, that's, that's a risk that you have to be aware of. And also if you have very large number of additions, that may reduce the overall depth as well. And that's something that Yuri had mentioned. So in conclusion, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I'd recommend just going into the, um, to the repository and trying the software out yourself and try different values of, of depth uh, and, and see what happens. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, there was one question that was asked that I did answer um, maybe I'll turn it over to you guys also, uh, both Yuri and Dave. I'm gonna just trying to page through. It was from Christian. Um, I don't totally understand the question, but uh, so could you set the multiplicative depth of up to log two and number of multiplications if the number of multiplications is a power of two? Um, is there a more efficient way to compute this if the ciphertexts are, are not equal? Um, I think the um, there was some typos in the beginning of the question, so I might be not be totally understanding. So, Christian, if you're answering, feel free to ask again, or uh, Yuri and Dave, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add. I basically said my initial response was that optimizing the number of multiplies is, is very application-dependent, um, and, and especially when you're mixing different sizes of data, 
and uh, it takes a bit of nuance. Uh, we have looked at it from time to time for various applications, but it might be easier to kind of dig on, dig into this on a one by one basis. Though so Dave and Yuri, you know, please correct anything I might be saying. Hmm. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not familiar with, well, actually the, 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 the question asked, it says divide a imperia, and I'm not sure exactly what that meant, but. Uh, so there's a question that just came in that uh, okay. Christian just answered. Thank you, Christian. Oh, okay. uh, divide it imperia is an algorithm which spits, splits the vector into two. I see what you're saying. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll add just mm -hmm. kind of a general note. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it may apply to this uh, particular application. It may not, uh, but uh, we, so we talked about this binary tree multiplication and uh, that we can benefit uh, from this approach to reduce the depth requirement to basically logarithm of the number of multiplications. And uh, sometimes, you know, we can leverage this, let's say we have some iterative algorithm that goes through many iterations. And one approach is to do a multiplication in each iteration. And basically, in this case, the depth requirement will just be uh, proportional to the number of iterations. But uh, to benefit from binary term multiplication, it's often useful to um, essentially write uh, multiple iterations, um, or I mean, maybe unroll multiple iterations into a certain closed form uh, that has basically that instead of, let's say, multiplication, you get something like degree seven, degree nine, etc. You write it out as, an, as a certain expression, and you're basically collapsing multiple iterations into one. And uh, the benefit of this is that then you can look at the, what is the high, highest power of multiplication that you're dealing with, and you can use the binary tree approach to minimize the depth requirement for that basically uh, iteration, uh, that new iteration. So essentially, it's, you can think of it as writing in closed form and then using the closed form expression uh, to reduce the depth. So this technique is sometimes useful. Uh, it, it depends really on what intermediate computations happen between multiplications. And like in, the, in this case, I think there are quite a few scalar, I mean, there are quite a few additions, so it, this, this approach could be quite challenging. Uh, but this is certainly writing out some iterative algorithm into a closed form and let's say reducing the number of iterations and trying to apply binary tree uh, technique is one of the common optimization approaches used in homomorphic encryption. And, and I know if the question was about that, but I wanted to add that note, it, it, it applies to any uh, type of iterative uh, algorithm. It, it, uh, if you look at <clears throat> from a formulaic point of view, right, if you can cast the computation as a, a product, you know, like capital pi, right, type of product form, um, then each individual um, entry, right, would give you basically, uh, you know, an, a, an, a final ciphertext. You would save all of those, and then you could use um, the function eval mol many to provide a, an overall combination of them, okay? Now, your algorithm may not have that form, and, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the, one of the um, things you have to look at. In, in the example I gave, right, you need to know, I mean, you can't, you're, you know, you, you can't just add up all of these multiplies and do them in, in, a, in a different uh, order. Every time you, every, every iteration, there is a value you need. It is the hash, right? And so you, you need to do that multiplication, get that hash, use that hash, and then you, your next iteration, you, you have another one. So you can't really um, cascade or, or pull multiplications out and then, and then do them all at the same time. So it really depends on what your, what your application uh, formulas are. And um, so, so, for example, um, uh, oftentimes, you know, you can, you can recombine um, your formulas to, to do eval mult many, and that will save you, as, as Yuri said, you know, kind of a log two value. But again, that's only in certain circumstances. And I, ho I hope that answers the question uh, better. <clears throat>
Um, it is it, it is definitely a challenge in in doing these operations. And one of the things you saw that when we we went into uh, a SIMD operation, oftentimes you have to use repeated um, constants, uh, and um, you know you're you're talking about now having mon multiple kinds of of encryption variables, right? Uh, do I have a what is really a single variable that's been repeated in all in all slots of a vector? Do I have a, a, a vector where every variable is going to be treated as a different value for the SIMD operation? So you know uh, you can imagine how it gets complicated quickly. So all set. Great, thank you, David Yuri. Um, any clarifying questions or any follow-up questions? There's been a very healthy kind of back and forth on the Q&A session. So this is all very good. Very happy to have this interaction. Um, mm -hmm. So this is good. I haven't seen any questions come in in the past minute or two. Um, Dave or Yuri, anything else you'd like to add as part of closing thoughts then? I thank everybody for attending and I hope it's been helpful. Yes, I'd like to uh, you know repeat that. You know, thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you everyone for the uh, back and forth and questions. Uh, this has been recorded for those of you that want to participate also or view it again. Uh, it'll be up on YouTube and also share it with your colleagues. Uh, the Palisade project, we're always looking for new contributors, new participants, uh, testers, you know, feedback on bugs, on improvements, anything else. Uh, contact us by your individual email or contact at palisade-crypto.org, palisade which is also on the website. And very happy to interact and answer any questions that other people might have offline also. Thanks again to participants and Dave and Yuri, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. Great, bye.